Senator, thank you very much for, uh, for coming. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for that wonderful meal. A little bit of Italy uh, in, uh, in Waterford. I just want to tell you one thing. I'm a gas bag, watch me. Uh, but I made a film in 1983 about the great Irish tenor, uh, John McCormack. Uh, and um, we had to go to, to Italy uh, and uh, record there. And we met a man I hadn't even heard of, because I knew very little about opera at that stage, Giuseppe Di Stefano, who had a most beautiful magical tenor voice. And I loathed him immediately I met him. I thought he was most awful, vulgar, ghastly man because he, he arrived in a white Rolls Royce and he had his shirt unbuttoned down to here and there were ropes of gold, you know, the oldest swinger in town. And he said, I see you look at my necklace. Callous, she give it to me. You know, the great Maria Callas. Callous, she love me. And I thought, well, geez, I don't. <laughs> and uh, then they made me go for dinner with him that night and I thought, Oh, this is going to be awful. I'm sure it'll be some dreadful, pretentious French place where you pay through the nose. I couldn't have been more wrong. He took us to the equivalent of a chip shop where they made stuff like um, Yorkshire pudding and they put it into the oven on a big spatula and flasks of red village wine. And the local people heard that Giuseppe Di Stefano was in the town, and they sent in a message to ask would he sing for them. And he stood up on the table, they opened the windows, and he sang out to the village square. And I thought it was the most lovely thing. So I fell in love with him. I thought, this is a wonderful man. So having started hating him, then I ended up loving him for his beautiful voice and his humanity. And I just misjudged him on my clothes. So if you think my clothes are awful, Inside is far worse, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, David, obviously your name is always preceded by the title Senator. Okay? Yes. So one of the first things that people are aware about you is that you are a politician. Yes. Uh, to some at the moment, that's something of a, a dirty word, politician. Politics is going through a rather fallow period in Ireland at the moment. What attracted you politics initially? Well, I, I wasn't attracted to politics when I was young. I mean, my, my family didn't vote at all. They just thought it was awful. Uh, and when I got elected eventually, I rang my aunt, who was well into her 80s, probably about 90 at the time, uh, to warn her. I thought she'd get a heart attack if she saw it on the 6 o'clock news, because I knew it was going to be on the news. And she just sighed and said, I suppose that means you'll be late for dinner. And she said, I've never understood why you would want to get mixed up with those appalling people. I mean, she never thought what they might think about getting mixed up with me, uh, because my reputation was pretty scandalous at that stage, and people tended to kind of back away. I remember one of the party leaders uh, escaping through a window uh, in a Chinese restaurant for the Chinese New Year because somebody from the press was going to take a photograph of the two of us, and I think he felt that his masculinity would be compromised if it was... <laughs> photographed together in a Chinese <laughs> restaurant. So I didn't in the beginning have very much to do with, with politics, but um, I think it was a sense of justice. I'm one of these people uh, who, I'm a picture straight guy. And I don't know if any of you read Christopher Isherwood's wonderful book, uh, Mr. Norris Changes Trains, uh, which is part of the kind of Sally Bowles thing that became the film and stage show uh, Cabaret. And in it, Mr. Norris expresses exactly what I feel when he says um, that he hates injustice because it disturbs his sense of decorum. It, it's there's something against the whole aesthetic thing. It's, it's ugly, unattractive, discordant, and it's kind of the global picture gone skewways. And my grandmother always told me about injustice, and I remember when we were reading, we were talking... Um, uh, Shane and myself about um, Dickens and I remember when we were coming down the street and your enjoyment of uh, Little Doris and David Copperfield and so on uh, but in A Tale of Two Cities um, the central character uh, sacrifices himself and the phrase uh, noblesse oblige 
because I remember my grandmother explaining this to me that it meant that if you had uh, some kind of gift or some kind of luxury or some position or status or money or whatever it was, there was an obligation to try and spread it around a little bit and make sure that other people who didn't have so much were included. And I think that's very good. Even from a selfish point of view, you know, you feel better. You're able to enjoy yourself a little bit more when you've paid off your debt. I mean, I had my 60th birthday six years ago. And to celebrate it, I flew over the original Dixieland jazz band from New Orleans, Louisiana. And they were the first jazz band in history. They recorded Tiger Rag and all these great classics in 1917, 1918 in New York. Uh, and it should have cost me $65,000. And everything was terribly extravagant. But I got them for nothing because I sold them on for a European tour. And Harry Crosby gave me um, Vicar Street uh, for the Friday night and said, put on the Dixieland band, you'll make the money for the party. And I said, no, much better. We'll put on the Dixieland band, we'll get lots of publicity for it, and we'll divide the money between the DePaul Trust and cancer, because one of my friends had cancer. And we did. You see, the great thing was we did all this stuff. We felt terribly good and, you know, all on the Friday night. And then we could let our hair down and, uh, you know, go ape on the Saturday night. So, so it, it was great. So there is this idea of lack of balance, injustice, which I hate, and discrimination and so on. Uh, and then... Senator, you're talking about the politician yes. as servant, yes. in a way. That's not something that many people would equate or understand at the moment, because we've had all of these terrible scandals where politicians appear to be using the yes. system for their own gain. Yes. Talk to me a little bit about how democracy works in Ireland. We have, you know, the Oireachtas, we have the Senate, we have the presidency, yes. which you have been associated with yourself of late. Um, how, how does it all work? Well, I don't think it does. I think that's the problem. Uh, it doesn't work. No, and I, I think people feel that the system is not responsive. It's not responsive enough. Uh, now, we're a parliamentary democracy, but the power is taken away from the parliament. And this is happening all over Europe. I mean, Tony Blair's government in Britain was a classic example of that. The decisions about the Iraq war and everything else were made by a small number of people, principally Blair, because he had this neurotic fixation with George Bush. Uh, and um, it's the same with us. I mean, recently there have been several examples where government policy was read in the newspaper uh, by uh, the leaders of the opposition. And it's the same even in the Senate. I got a note from Joe Toole uh, the other day where he'd been sent briefing material uh, by the hospice movement because the leader of the, the House had decided to hold a debate on a Wednesday uh, to grant this debate to one of the members, and he hadn't told anybody else. But the newspapers had it. You know, so it's a little bit disconcerting to read first of all what day you're coming back and then what the subject is. Read in the newspaper. You don't get notice. You're not uh, given the opportunity to, pre to prepare for it. So there's a lot wrong with uh, the democracy that we have. Uh, and I know Enda Kenny made himself very popular with some people by uh, talking about abolishing the Senate. But I don't think they should. There are 60 members of the Senate, of whom 11 are nominated directly by the Taoiseach without any reference to anybody else. There's not even the farce of an election. And then there are 43 that are elected on a panel system which relates to the county councils, and the councils have the vote there, only the councillors. So it's less than a thousand votes. And in the most recent election, which was the by election, the entire electoral roll, the whole electorate, was 237 votes. Now, the only seats that have real constituencies are the university seats. I represent the graduates of Trinity. There are about 65,000 of them. Joe O'Toole, my colleague with whom I work very, care, very closely, uh, he's uh, representing the NUI, and they have about 115,000. So those are real constituencies. And to be told that you're undemocratic by people who are elected on a rigged vote of 237 votes, it's a bit much to stomach. 